Today's lecture is about improper integrals. That will be the last section of chapter 7, section 7.8. Now we are going to see some general properties of improper integrals. So first thing is to see what the improper integral is actually. So we have two types of integrals that we will name improper when the integrand, a function that we are integrating, has a vertical asymptote in the interval, so that it will be a discontinuous function at some point in the interval. For instance, function 1 over x squared, if we want to integrate it between negative 1 and 2, well, we see that at 0, x equals 0, we have a problem, the function is not continuous, and we will have a vertical asymptote there. So because of that, we will call this integral improper. Another example is a function 1 over radical 1 minus x. If we try to integrate it between 0 and 1, we see at 0 we don't have any problems, but at x equal 1, we will have a problem, we have division by 0. So basically, we see that at the bound, x equal 1, we will have a vertical asymptote. So that's one type of improper integrals. So they look like our regular integrals, but they are actually not. And another type is when the interval integration is actually infinite. So here we integrate 1 over radical x, but over the interval 1 to infinity. So our interval is infinite, therefore this integral itself is called improper. Another example when you have minus infinity as one of the bounds, or if we have minus infinity as a lower bound and plus infinity as an upper bound. So that will be another example of improper integral. And combined case would be an integral from 0 to infinity of a function 1 over x minus 1 everything squared. So obviously we see the infinity as one of the bounds, so we know this integral will be improper. However, since our interval is from 0 to infinity, and this function here has a problem at x equal 1, we have a vertical asymptote. So, in fact, this interval integral here will be improper, and we have two reasons for it. One is the upper bound that is infinity, and the second one is the existence of a vertical asymptote in our interval of integration. So these functions will be integrated. They look like our regular uh, integrals, but they're not. They have problems. Either they have infinite bounds or they have vertical asymptotes somewhere in the integral of in uh, interval of integration. So because of that, it is extremely important to avoid simply applying the theorem fundamental theorem of calculus because it doesn't apply in these situations. We see, for instance, the function 1 over x squared is positive, and if we try to integrate it between negative 1 and 2, obviously we have a problem at 0, but if we just forget about it, we will get an answer that is obviously incorrect, and it's negative. How can an area under a curve that is always positive, how that area could be negative? So we see that applying the fundamental theorem without first checking the conditions would be a great error. We remember that the fundamental theorem requires continuous integrand. So our function 1 over x squared is not continuous over the interval negative 1 and 2 because at 0 we have a vertical asymptote. So we could not actually apply the fundamental theorem at all in this case. So what do we do? Well, we need a strategy, obviously, applying bluntly fundamental theorem of calculus will not work. So we need a different approach. So what do we do? Well, we will compute these integrals using the limits. So let's illustrate this. So I have here an improper integral uh, of a function 1 over radical 1 minus x, and I integrate between 0 and 1. And again, at x equal 1, we have a vertical asymptote. So we see here the function, and at x equal 1, we have a vertical asymptote. So actually, function is increasing without bound 
as we approach one. So basically, we have a problem here. However, if we stop at R, so any number lower than one between zero and one, what happens? Well, this integral here is our regular definite integral. There is no issues here. So from zero to R, we don't have any problems. The only issue is when X is equal to one. So as long as we don't touch one, we are fine. We can compute this area here. And then obviously if we have R approaching one, the area that we are getting will be closer and closer to what we are looking for. We are looking for the area between zero and one of this function. So if we keep increasing R towards one, well, the area that we are that we have will be closer and closer to the area we are looking for. So basically, we are going to use the limits here. If the computer is used and this function is simply evaluated for different values of R, we see that the integral actually approaches 2. Well, that's a good news. So we have an area here that is closer and closer to 2 as r goes to 1. So we will just translate this using the notation of limit. So basically we have a definite integral with r going to 1 from the left side obviously that's why we write r goes to 1 negative so it comes to 1 from the left. So that's clear here. So what do we do? Well, we find the antiderivative as we would normally do. Antiderivative is here and we evaluate at the bounds 0 and r. So this is the computation and the next step is to compute the limit of this expression as r goes to 1. So what happens? At r goes to 1, this expression here goes to 0. This expression here is 1. So we have 0 plus 2 times 1. That's 2. Well, that looks like the number that we were having here in the table using the computer. So our approach will be to, to use limits to compute these integrals here. Each time we find a vertical asymptote, well, we will replace the expression by a limit and then we will proceed. If we have a vertical asymptote somewhere in the middle, we will break the integral in two pieces and proceed with the limits. So we formalize this in the case of an asymptote at a bound. So if the asymptote is at the upper bound B, so we integrate between A and B, and at B we have vertical asymptote, so basically we replace this integral, integral by an expression limit when r goes to b from the left of the integral between a and r of a function. Similarly, if we have a vertical asymptote at a lower bound, in this case, let's say 2, so when we come to 2 from the right, so that's why we have plus. We'll compute the limit when r goes to a plus of r to b of the function. So basically our lower bound is where the issue is. So this is a way we are going to comp try to compute these integrals. So in the case where the limits exist, so if the limit exists means the expression goes to a fixed value, then we say that the improper interval converges to that value, obviously, or we say the integral is convergent. In the case where the limit does not exist, then we say that the proper improper integral diverges, or we say that improper integral is divergent. So if this limit here exists, then the integral is convergent. If the limit does not exist, then the integral is divergent. So convergent when 
limit exists, divergent when the limit does not exist. And we said if we have a vertical asymptote somewhere inside the integral of integration, so somewhere between A and B, we have a point C where actually our function has a vertical asymptote. What do we do? Well, we will just break our original integral between A and B. We will break it in two pieces. One piece will go from A to C and the other piece will go from C to B. So basically we just break it in two pieces. Now, if both of these integrals converge, which means they converge to a fixed number, this one will converge, let's say, where towards L1 and this one will converge towards L2, so those are fixed real numbers, then we can add them, obviously, and our original integral is also converging and it converges to a fixed number, which is L1 plus L2. In the case where at least one of these two integrals is divergent, then our original integral is also divergent. So as soon as one of the integral diverges, we don't even need to compute the second one because the result will be uh, divergent. So in the case where we have an infinite interval of integration, which means one of the bounds is infinity or minus infinity, or we might have a case where actually integral goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. What do we do? Well, we assume that we have a function and then we integrate on an infinite interval from A to infinity. And again, this is improper integral, so we will rewrite it in terms of a limit. So we say when R goes to infinity and then we have our integral from A to R. So this integral, integral here is definite and everything is fine. So we will compute it normally and then at the last stage we will let R go to infinity and see what the limit is. So we can have an upper bound that is infinity or we can have a lower bound that is minus infinity and then obviously the definition will be analogous so we have r going to minus infinity so the lower bound is replaced by r instead of negative infinity to a and then we again compute this interval integral here and then at the last stage we let r go to negative infinity and see if the limit exists or not. Obviously, if the limit exists, our integral will be convergent, so it converges to a fixed value, and if the limit does not exist, then our improper integral diverges, and we complete the process by concluding if the integral is convergent or divergent. So what happens in the case where we have an infinite interval of integration but the bounds are minus infinity and plus infinity? So basically we have some function integrated over all real numbers. Well, we will choose a point somewhere between minus infinity and plus infinity. We pick any point we like and we break our original integral into two pieces. So any real value will work and give the same conclusion, same result. So we can pick any one. Obviously, when both of the interval integrals converge, then we will say that our original integral between minus infinity plus infinity also converges. However, if at least one of these integrals is divergent, it diverges, then our original integral is also divergent. So as soon as one of the components is divergent, it's game over, the original integral is divergent. However, if both of components are convergent, so they converge to a fixed value, then our original integral is also convergent and converges to some fixed value. It is extremely important to realize that in the case of 
an improper integral with bounds negative infinity and plus in, positive infinity, we avoid writing things in this manner. We have to break our original integral into two pieces. We pick a number a anywhere and we break our original integral into two pieces. Otherwise, we might end up with wrong results. For instance, if we integrate x between minus infinity and plus infinity, we need to break it at any value. 75 is good, but normally people would take 0 as a breaking point. So we have an integral between negative infinity and 0, and then from 0 to plus infinity. So obviously, this side here diverges. If you integrate, you will see it diverges. Therefore, since one of the pieces diverges, the entire original integral is also divergent. And that's it, finished. In this case, obviously, both pieces are divergent, but as soon as one is divergent, our original integral is divergent. Game over. However, if somebody would like to write things this way, well, for any choice of real number r, integral of x between negative r and r is 0. So the conclusion that somebody would get in this case is 0. That would be a wrong conclusion. The correct conclusion is that this integral here is divergent. So be careful, never write things this way. You need to break your original integral into two pieces if you have both of the bounds as minus infinity and plus infinity. So be extremely careful. To summarize all of that, we say we have a function and then we have a discontinuity or vertical asymptote at the point B, which is the right hand side bound. Then we rewrite the integral this way with the limit when t goes to B from the left. So now if this limit exists, we say that our integral here is convergent, converges towards a number. In the case that where we have a discontinuity at a, so vertical asymptote at a, we will rewrite our integral. So the trouble point is a, so we write the limit of t, a limit when t goes to a from the right. And if this limit exists, then our original integral is convergent also, so because it converges towards a number. Obviously, if this limit doesn't exist, then our integral is divergent and it doesn't exist. If we have a discontinuity somewhere in between the integration bound, so at some point C, that means we have a vertical asymptote at C, then we will break our original integral into two pieces from A to C, the trouble point C, and then from C to B. And we will compute each of these integrals separately. If both of them converge, then our original integral converges also. If one of them diverges, original integral diverges also. And in the case of infinite bounds, so if one of the bounds is infinity, in this case, let's say upper bound is plus infinity, we rewrite the integral as limit when t goes to infinity between a and t. And if this limit exists, we will say that our original integral is convergent. And if the limit doesn't exist, the original integral is divergent. In the case of the integral with the lower bound negative infinity, we rewrite again the trouble point will be the lower bound, so limit when t goes to negative infinity between t and b. If this limit exists, that means that our integral is convergent, and if the limit doesn't exist, it means that the integral is divergent. And we said if we have integral between negative infinity and positive infinity, we need to break that into two pieces and pick a real number somewhere. Sometimes it's zero, it could be two, it depends what is convenient. And in the case where both of these integrals are convergent, 
then our original integral is also convergent. If one of these pieces is divergent, then our original integral is divergent as well. So let's have a quick example. So we have a function 1 over x squared, and we try to integrate it between negative 1 and 0. So at negative 1 we don't have any problems, and the problem appears only at the bound x equals 0, because then we have division by 0. That means we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Now, trouble point is the upper bound. So we need to rewrite the integral. Since we found that the trouble point is the upper bound, we replace 0 by a number r, and we say we will take limit when r goes to 0. From the left, obviously, because the interval is negative 1, 0. So we rewrite it. Now, at this stage, we will try to compute this integral here. Normally, as we would in a normal circumstances. Okay, so what is the integral of 1 over x squared? Well, it is negative 1 over x. And then we need to evaluate it at negative 1 and r, as we would do normally. Once we complete the calculation, we have something like this. At this stage, we let r go to 0. And we compute the limit. So obviously, if r goes to 0, 1 over r is exploding. So we are coming to 0 from the left. Integral goes from negative 1 to 0. So that's our interval, negative 1 to 0. So we are coming to 0 from the left side, so in the negative numbers. So 1 over r will be huge negative number with minus in front. So minus minus, it gives plus. That's why we have positive infinity here. So basically, this limit does not exist because the expression that we have is exploding. It is increasing without bound. It goes to plus infinity. So this integral is divergent. The limit does not exist. Original integral is divergent. Another example. We have, again, a function 1 over x squared. This time, we integrate between negative 1 and 2. We know that at x equals 0, we have a problem. So we will need to break this integral into two pieces, because we go from minus 1 to 2, but at 0, we have a problem. So we need to stop at 0. So we break it into two pieces, integral between negative 1 and 0, and then we continue from 0 to 2, obviously, of our function 1 over x squared. So now, if both of these pieces are convergent, our original integral is convergent. If at least one of them is divergent, then the original integral is also divergent. Well, we just found that the first piece is divergent. So if the first piece diverges, then obviously the entire thing diverges as well. So there is no need to compute this side, because we already know that the first part is divergent. That means that our original integral is divergent as well. Another example, 1 over x minus 1 integrated between 0 and 3. We see that at x equal 1 we have division by 0, so our integrand here is discontinuous, and the trouble point is x equal 1, we have a vertical asymptote there. So what do we do? We break our integral into two pieces from 0 up to 1, because 1 is trouble point, and then from 1 to 3. So now, if both of these pieces are convergent, our original integral is convergent. If one of these pieces is divergent, then the entire integral is divergent. So let's see what's going on. So if we try to study the situation with the part from 1 to 3, what happens? Well, we know that at 1 we have a problem. Our lower bound is a trouble point. So we need to rewrite this integral formally as a limit and replace 1 by r. And then we need to let r go to 1. So our integral will be from r to 3 because 1 is a trouble point. So we replace integral by the limit when r goes to 1 from r to 3. OK, so now this part here is our regular integral. So let's find the antiderivative. 
and evaluated the bounds. So antiderivative is the log of x minus 1 in absolute values and now we need to evaluate this expression at the bounds x equal 3 and x equal r. Let's see what happens. So if you plug 3 inside then minus when we plug r so we have log 2 minus log r minus 1. So log 2 is a number so we can take it out of the limit there is no issue there and now we need to compute the limit of log of r minus 1 when r goes to 1. So what does it mean? Well it means that r minus 1 goes to 0 when r goes to 1 obviously so we have actually a limit of ln u when u goes to 0. While we know from the graph of log when argument goes to 0 then the log goes to negative infinity so it decreases without bound which means that this integral will be divergent because this limit here does not exist. Indeed, as you go to zero, then the expression, because we had negative negative, will increase without bound, so basically the limit does not exist. So if this limit does not exist, that means that our original integral is divergent. So basically we just regroup everything, we see that the limit does not exist, this means that the improper integral is divergent, since one piece is divergent, therefore the entire integral, original integral is divergent as well. So there is no need to compute the first part, but if we did, we would still conclude that it's divergent because the first part itself is divergent. So whenever we have a trouble point somewhere, like here at 1, we need to break the integration to two pieces. So our original integral is broken into two different integrals. And then we treat each one of them separately. Here we have another example. This time we have a function 1 over radical x and we try to integrate it between 0 and 1. Obviously at 1 we don't have any issues but the trouble starts when x is at 0, because then we have division by 0. So this function will have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. So what do we do in this case? Well, our trouble point is the lower bound, so we need to rewrite the integral as limit when r goes to 0, plus, because we are in the interval 0, 1, so when r comes to 0 from the right, and then we integrate our function 1 over radical x between r and 1. So how do we do that? Well, we treat this as a definite integral, as we would normally. So we find the antiderivative, so that's 2 radical x, and we evaluate it between x equal r and x equal 1. So if we plug it in, we have this expression here. So now we compute the limit, so that's the last step. When r goes to 0, radical r goes to 0. So here we will have 2 times 1 minus 0. So 2 times 1 is 2. So this integral here is actually convergent and converges to 2. Now we have the exact same function, 1 over radical x, but this time we changed the interval of integration. So instead of being an integral from 0 to 1, now we go from 1 to infinity. So this is an improper integral because we have a bound that is infinity. So what do we do in this case? Well, we need to rewrite our original integral because the trouble point is the upper bound. We rewrite it as integral between 1 and r when r limit when r goes to infinity. So now we need to find the antiderivative as we did previously. So basically in this case what we have is a limit of an expression which is 2 times radical r minus 2. So radical r when r goes to infinity goes to infinity as well. So this means that this expression here will increase without bound. So the limit does not exist. So if this limit does not exist our original integral is divergent. So we will say the 
integral diverges. So we saw in a previous case, same function, integral between 0 and 1, it was convergent and converges to 2. And the same function, integral between 1 and infinity, well, we found out that actually this integral is divergent because this area here will increase without bound as x goes to infinity. That's very curious. What happens if our function is 1 over x squared? Well, using a similar procedure, we will write it as a limit. So basically, we will have to integrate between 1 and some value t here, and then we will let t increase towards plus infinity and see what happens. So again, the integral of 1 over x squared is negative 1 over x. We evaluated the bounds as we usually would do it. So we get an expression which is 1 minus 1 over t. So we realize that this is smaller than 1. Now what happens to this expression when we let t go to plus infinity? Well, 1 over t will die. It goes to 0. Indeed, if we compute the limit when t goes to plus infinity of 1 minus 1 over t, well, 1 over t will go to 0, so this limit is 1. That means, since the limit exists, it is equal to 1, our integral of 1 over x squared between 1 and infinity is convergent. So it converges to 1. And we see the area is increasing as t increases. And when we let t go to plus infinity, the area goes to 1. Very curious. So integral of 1 over x squared between 1 and infinity is equal to 1. This means this integral here is convergent. So that's very interesting observation. So what we realized is that the integral between 1 and infinity of 1 over x squared is convergent because the, the, that integral is 1. However, if we integrate the same function 1 over x squared between 0 and 1, we found that is that integral is divergent. Indeed, if we compute, we get limit of 1 over r minus 1 when r goes to 0. So when r goes to 0, 1 over r increases without bound, explodes. So this limit does not exist. Therefore, the integral between 0 and 1 diverges. So we have a sa the same function but two different intervals of integration and two different conclusions. So we need to be really careful regarding the functions and the integral we compute because the bounds, the interval of integration, the bounds are super important. In the case of 1 over x we realize that integral between 1 and infinity was divergent and if we compute the integral between 0 and 1 we conclude again that that part is also divergent which means we have an infinite area so in summary what we realized is whenever we have a finite area under the curve we say the integral is convergent, and when the area is infinite, the integral is divergent. So those functions 1 over x and 1 over x squared, they are interesting, and there is a more general result that follows. In general, what we have when we have an integral between 1 and infinity of a function 1 over x to power p. So it's called p integrals. We can compute this and realize that the integral is convergent when p is strictly greater than 1. And the integral is divergent when p is equal to 1 or smaller than 1. And we have examples here when p is equal to 1, 1 over x, integral between 1 and infinity diverges. 
when p is greater than 1, in this case p is equal to 1 over x squared, integral between 1 and infinity, is equal to 1, so that part is convergent. So it is important to realize that and remember these two expressions when they are convergent and when they are divergent. Let's try another example. So we need to see if our integral is convergent or divergent and we integrate the function 1 over radical x minus 2 between 2 and 5. So we realize quickly that at x equal 2 we have a problem, we have division by 0. So our function is discontinuous at the lower bound at x equal 2. So we will have a vertical asymptote at x equal 2 like we see here. Okay, what does it mean? Well, it means we need to rewrite our original integral. Since the lower bound is the troublemaker, we write limit when t goes to 2 plus, because it comes from the right, of our function an integral between t and 5. And now we will proceed as usual. We will compute this integral here using the antiderivative and the fundamental theorem and then the, at the last moment we will let t go to 2 and see what happens if the limit exists or not so let's do it we rewrite as we said trouble point is x equal 2 so we rewrite this as a limit when x goes to 2 from the right integral of our function between t and 5 so we find the antiderivative, which is 2 radical x minus 2. Now we evaluate it at the bounds, as we usually do, and we get this expression. So now the last stage is we compute the limit of the expression as t goes to, zero, uh, to 2 from the right side. So as t goes to 2, t minus 2 goes to 0. So radical of the expression goes to 0 as well. So all of this converges to 2 times radical 3. Therefore, this limit exists, it's 2 radical 3, that means that our integral is convergent. And now we can say that area under the curve 1 over radical x minus 2, between 2 and 5, is finite. Well, in this case we have a function 1 over 1 plus x squared, so this is a positive function, and we try to integrate it between negative infinity and positive infinity, and see what happens. So we have the trouble at two bounds, because the integral is improper because of the infinite bounds. Lower bound is infinite and upper bound is infinite. And we said in this case we need to break the integral into two pieces. So we pick any value a natural pick would be 0, so we break this integral into two pieces, from minus infinity to 0, and from 0 to plus infinity. Now we need to study both of these integrals, and if both of them are convergent, so they go, their limit exists, and then they converge to a number, then, since both of them are convergent, our original expression will be convergent as well. However, in the case that one of them is divergent, then our original integral would be divergent. So let's compute each of these integrals and see what happens. So if we compute integral between negative infinity and zero, so that's an improper integral. Why? Well, because lower bound is negative infinity, so we need to rewrite this integral as a limit. So limit when r goes to minus infinity, and its integral between r and 0 of our function. So now we compute this definite part here as we would normally. So the antiderivative in this case is tan inverse of x and we evaluate the antiderivative at x equal r and x equal 0 as we usually would do. So now we get an expression tan inverse of 0 is 0 so we have now the final expression is minus log a limit of the expression when r goes to negative infinity. So tan of r when r goes to negative infinity, tan of r will go to negative pi over 2.
So we have negative, negative, so that gives us pi over 2. Well, that's good news. That means that our limit exists. It's pi over 2. So our integral, improper integral, here between minus infinity and 0, also exists. It's convergent, and its value is pi over 2. Okay, so let's compute the other part. The part that goes from 0 to plus infinity. Again, we have improper integral because one of the bounds is infinity. So we need to rewrite it as a limit. Again, the antiderivative will be tan and we evaluate it between 0 and r. So again, tan inverse of 0 is 0. So our final expression is limit when r goes to infinity of tan inverse r. And we know in this case, this will go to pi over 2. So the second integral is also convergent because it's equal to pi over 2. So both pieces are convergent. In this case, both pieces go to pi over 2. So the value of this integral is pi over 2. The value of the other integral is pi over 2. So we add them and our final expression for our original integral will be pi over 2 plus pi over 2 equal pi. So our original integral is actually convergent and its value is pi. Another example, again we have two bounds, minus infinity and infinity, so our integral is improper and we need to break into two pieces and see what happens. So the piece here from 0 to infinity we can compute by finding the antiderivative and then letting r go to infinity and see what happens. We will find that it converges. However, the first part, the integral between negative infinity and 0, well, we have trouble point at negative infinity. So basically, we need to write it as a limit. We find the antiderivative, evaluate the antiderivative of the bounds. We get an expression. Now, this expression, exponential of 0 is 1, that's fine. So negative 1 plus exponential of negative r. So limit when r goes to negative infinity, this will be exponential of negative negative, so it's plus. So exponential of a big number. Well, that will be a huge number. So the limit when r goes to minus infinity of exponential minus r does not exist because the expression increases without bound. And we just note it here as equal to infinity, just saying that our expression increases without bound. So this means that the limit does not exist. It's not a number. It keeps in the, the, the expression of a function keeps increasing and increasing and increasing. So the values are higher and higher. So this means this limit does not exist. So if this limit does not exist, our part of the integral is divergent. So the part between negative infinity and zero is divergent. That means then that the entire integral between negative infinity and infinity is also divergent. As soon as one part is divergent, the entire integral is divergent. Another example of integration with improper integral, here we integrate between negative infinity and zero and function is x exponential x. So it is improper because one of the limits is negative infinity and we need to rewrite the expression. Obviously when we integrate x exponential x we will go by parts. So we rewrite the expression. The trouble point is lower bound so we replace it. So we integrate between r and zero and we take the limit when r goes to negative infinity. So this integral here from r to 0 of x exponential x, we proceed by parts, as we usually do. And then we get to evaluate it at bounds. So at the end, once we are done with all the procedures, we have an expression and we need to compute the integral of the, uh, the limit of that expression as r goes to negative infinity. So obviously exponential 0 is 1, exponential r, as r goes to negative infinity, this will go to 0. Now the only trouble point, trouble expression is this one here, 
negative r exponential r. When r goes to negative infinity, we have a problem here. We have an indeterminate form, infinity times 0. And we don't like that. So we will need to rewrite it and probably use L'Hopital's rule. So we have to compute the limit here. One piece is equal to 1. The other piece will go to 0. We see it. And the third piece, r exponential r, is causing problems here because it's indeterminate form infinity times 0. So we need to treat this part to see what the limit is. We need to rewrite it. So what do we do? Well, from Calc 1, the easiest thing is to send exponential below with the negative sign. So now we rewrote our original expression that was indeterminate form infinity times 0 and now we have an expression infinity over infinity and now we know we can use L'Hopital's rule we differentiate the upper part differentiate the down part the lower so derivative of numerator is 1 the derivative of denominator is negative exponential minus r and the limit of this when r goes to negative infinity will be 0 so by L'Hopital's rule, we know that this limit here is zero. So that helps us bring everything together now into our expression. So our trouble point, actually, the trouble expression, we know it's going to zero. So the limit of the first part will be zero. This is exponential zero is one and exponential r, when r goes to negative infinity, goes to zero. So basically the limit is negative one. So, our initial integral is convergent. Now we have a slightly different function, x exponential negative x square. And we integrate it between negative infinity and positive infinity. So, what we have here is an improper integral because our bounds are infinity. So we need to break this integral into two pieces and then treat each piece separately. So the first part, again, we choose zero because it's convenient, but it could be any other number. 75 would work just as well. So we break our original integral into two pieces, two integrals. So between negative infinity and zero and from zero to infinity. And we need to treat each part separately. Again, the first part has in negative infinity as one of the bounds, so it is improper and we need to treat that bound using the limit. And the second part has upper bound infinity, so it's improper and we need to treat the upper bound. So we replace it by r and we let the limit r go to infinity. So we need to compute these two pieces one at a time. So integral of x exponential negative x square. If we look a little bit, if we check what's going on, we see that if u is negative x square, then du is negative 2x dx. Well, we have x dx here. So this simplifies things a little bit. So at the end, we need just to integrate exponential u e to power u du. Now we changed variables. We went from x to du. So dx du. Change of variables means we need to change the bounds as well. So when x is equal r, u is equal minus r square. Ah, lower bound is negative r square. When x is equal 0, u is equal 0 as well. So our bounds are adapted to our new variable. We change variables, we change bounds. So limits of integration need to follow. We need to change them correctly to represent, to take care of the bounds and the, to adapt it to the variable, to the new variable. Okay, so now we integrate exponential u, that's easy. And we evaluate 
the antiderivative between negative r square and zero because as we said new variable new bounds so we get this and now final step is we compute the limit as r goes to negative infinity so in this case this will go to zero exponential zero is one so all this expression here goes to one and it multiplies negative one over two so the limit here is negative one over two so since the limit exists it's a finite number now negative number is just fine that means that our integral is convergent okay so the first part works the second part we proceed similarly and we find that the second limit is also equal to a number fixed number in this case 1 over 2 so that means that our integral improper integral is convergent as well so two parts both of them are convergent that means we can now add the values so the first expression is equal to negative 1 over 2 the second expression is equal to 1 over 2 we add them and we get that the total value is 0 so our original integral between negative infinity and plus infinity is 0 so it's convergent it has a finite value so that's a convergent integral and its value is 0 another example with ln x and we try to integrate it between 0 and 1 and see what happens so we have a representation here of a function ln x between 0 and 1 and we compute this area here to see if it's finite or not so this is an improper integral because at x equals 0 we have a vertical asymptote log x is not defined so we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0 so our trouble point is the lower bound so we will rewrite original integral as limit when r goes to 0, so it's integral between 0 and 1, so we come to 0 from the right, so that's why we write here, r goes to 0 plus integral of ln between r and 1. So we remember that the integral of ln is x ln minus x, so all we need to do now is evaluate it between x equal r and x equal 1 as we usually would and we get this expression here simplify it a little bit because ln 1 is 0 so this is our final expression now we need to compute the limit again negative 1 doesn't change much but now we have here expression r ln r well when r goes to 0 r goes to 0 fine but ln r goes to negative infinity so again we will have an indeterminate form infinity times 0 as last time we need to rewrite it and then use L'Hopital's rule so we rewrite the expression r ln r as ln over 1 over r so now we have indeterminate form infinity over infinity and we can apply L'Hopital's rule derivative of the numerator and derivative of denominator the numerator is ln r so derivative is 1 over r and denominator is 1 over r derivative is negative 1 over r square we simplify and we get expression negative r so now we compute the limit when r goes to 0 of negative r while well, limit is 0 well that's good news now we can put everything together our original integral was written as a limit when r goes to 0 plus of integral of ln between r and 1 and now we figured out that this was all equal to this expression in which we just computed the last limit which was 0 so our final answer is negative 1 so the area as we saw here the area here is 1 but it is below the x-axis that's why we have negative sign in front in our answer so the 
improper integral ln x between 0 and 1 the value is negative 1 so it's a convergent integral a new function another example 1 over x minus 1 squared so we have an integral between 0 and infinity so first thing is we have one of the bounds that is infinity so it is improper integral immediately another issue is we realize here that, that at x equal 1 our function is not defined we have division by 0 so we have vertical asymptote at x equal 1 so those are two reasons for which this integral is improper so we need to treat it accordingly so first thing is to treat the vertical asymptote so we have a trouble point in our interval so interval is zero infinity trouble point is at x equal one so we break our original integral into two pieces first piece from zero to a trouble point one and then from the trouble point to infinity so we split it into pieces great now we realize again that this part here the second part integral between one and infinity has a problem again it is improper because it has one of the bounds infinity but again at x equal one we have a problem so we will need to treat that again so that's what we observed the first part obviously has a problem at one so we need to rewrite it but the second part has a problem at one and also has an infinite bound so we need to treat that accordingly we need to break it two pieces again so we need to pick a number in the interval one infinity any number will do for convenience we choose x equal two but it could be x equal 75 just as well and nothing would be wrong everything would be fine so we pick a number between one and infinity in that interval and we break this integral here the second part into two pieces our choice was two so basically we have our old part from zero to one and then we broke the part from one to infinity into two pieces from one to two and from two to infinity why because we had double trouble here so the double trouble was infinity as a low our, uh, upper bound and we had a trouble at x equal one we had an asymptote there so we needed to treat both of these so first we broke it into two pieces from one to two and then from two to infinity obviously now we can start treating each piece separately so if all three of them converge then our original integral converges but if any of these three at least one diverges that means that our original interval integral diverges as well so we already saw that the first part will be divergent we can compute the second part and discover it is divergent as well it's not necessary but we can do that so basically our original integral was divergent we just discovered that it is important to realize that in this case we had double trouble and we had to break our first integral into two pieces and then one of those pieces had to be broken again into two pieces so each time we have trouble points or uh, one of the bounds is infinity we need to deal with that separately so this integral here we concluded was divergent so that concludes the presentation and it would be good to start practicing a little bit from the book examples and the exercises